Airing first on Asheville FM, WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina, this is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcast and podcast emanating out of occupied Jalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices from struggles for liberation from all around the world. This week I appeared on the Time Talks podcast, which is a member of the Channel Zero Network alongside of us. It's a network of anarchist podcasts. Time Talks has done a couple of these mixtapes where Chris Steele, the host of it, who does hip hop under the name Time, invites other podcasters from the network on to just sort of pick music around a theme and discuss why they like those songs. It's just sort of of like a fun way to hear new music, I guess. And it's kind of different from the pattern of what The Final Straw usually does, which is nice. Hope you enjoy. There's also a Spotify playlist that Chris is hosting that you can find a link to in our show notes with some more songs that we didn't get to feature. And we do recommend that you check out Time Talks podcast. It's a really good long form interview, usually author and activist format show. Welcome to episode 46 of the Time Talks podcast, part of the Channel Zero Network. This episode, I had the pleasure of collaborating with Burst from the Final Straw Radio podcast for another mixtape show. The show highlights artists and songs that speak on the horrors of the prison industrial complex and honor people who have fought, who are building, imagining, and are doing the hard work every day of fighting for prison abolition. Burst and I share songs and have a conversation about their meaning to us and the stories and experiences behind them. Thank you to Awareness for the music, and here's a brief jingle from a fellow Channel Zero Network member. I know the kind of pain you're feeling, Alex. I once had it myself. You some kind of doctor? No, Alex. I am Magneto, and I have come to offer you Sanctuary. Hello, this is our jingle for our podcast, The Grounded Futures Show. This is the show where we discuss topics ranging from climate change to identity to how youth can gain new skills to thrive amid current and ongoing disasters that we are collectively facing. We are your hosts, one Gen Z Liam and one Gen X Carla. And we think we all deserve to thrive now and not in some distant utopian future. Yeah, but that's... In the future. Oh, I hate the future. Yeah, we're with Bolin. Grounded Futures is a larger project. So check that out over at groundedfutures.com. Casual radio show. Hey, this is the uh, Drag <laughs> Morning Show with uh, Chris Burst. We're... First, I wanted to thank you for coming on this episode with me to do Prison Abolition Mixtape. You're from the Final Straw radio show, which is a podcast and a show that I've looked up to even before I've known you. So I really thank you for for doing the show with me and I'll go ahead and let you just give a little brief summary of your show. Sure. Chris, thanks a lot for, for inviting me. This is going to be fun. I'm excited. Uh, and mutually, I've, I really appreciate your show. And I'd, I'd heard your music before, but I didn't put two and two together until a little bit after the um, I started listening to episodes. But I anyway, I can I can. Thank you. Yeah, I gush about it later. But um, yeah, so um, The Final Straw is a show that's been, it's a radio show based out of so-called Asheville, North North Carolina and occupied Jalagi land in Appalachia. And it's myself and two other main hosts. And we produce a weekly radio show that airs on about a dozen stations around the U.S. And it's been going since 2010. And we just, we feature interviews with authors and philosophers and historians and activists engaged in feminist struggle or anti-racist, anti-fascist struggle in in, um, decolonization work or anti-infrastructure, like pro-eco-defense stuff. We're kind of all over the place. We try to feature prisoner voices when we can. We have a regular segment with Sean Swain on most episodes if he has access to a phone which is a mixture of comedy and, um, and cultural critique. But yeah, so it's, it's good. It's felt good in this last um, just over a year. We've been using our Patreon money, almost all of it to, like some of it will cover some of our other expenses, but to cover transcription um, and making zines and some comrades have been helping to uh, produce the transcripts of our weekly interviews into zines and helping us get them out there to distros 
um, and info shops and stuff. So if you do prisoner support and you check out our interviews and they look interesting enough that you'd want a prisoner to be able to get a hold of that and maybe start a reading group inside, we do at least like 52 a year at this point. I'm pretty proud and stoked of that. And that's also led to some translation of some of our interviews for wider dispersion of um, international solidarity. But that's, I could, I could yammer on for a long time about that. Chris, uh, would you talk a little bit about Time Talks for my audience that may not be familiar with your work? You are also in the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and it's a podcast that I listen to every episode of. Thank you. And I just wanted to echo that. I appreciate what the final straw and you all do. The segments with Sean Swain are awesome and that you are always giving prisoners support shout outs and addresses and way to reach them. And that's so important is like most people in the U.S., I have friends who are imprisoned and it's so important just writing to them, even a letter of just what's going on with your life. It means so much. And just love that you all do that. And my podcast is called the Time Talks podcast. It looks at history, politics, music and art. And I really just look at themes of liberation or justice or anti-colonialism and talk to a lot of theorists or authors, also people who do like activist type work. I don't know the the word around that's not some buzzword, but people who just do this really good work and thinking and uh, look to break down books and just just have good conversations about things that really need to be talked about like prison abolition or anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism. I like how that's like a common theme among at least four of the shows on the, on the Channel Zero Network that I can think of. Because that, that was like how I started. It was like, I want to talk to authors about the questions that I have about books. And I know Soul, like what the Soul cast was doing, like a similar, a similar theme too. And um, Works in Theory, I guess, like one of the newer editions. Oh, yeah. I think it's a great idea. Like... I don't know. How do you, how do you find that? Or do you find that reading a book for, I mean, as a, as someone who is a teacher as well, like f- does, it, does it change the way that you engage with material or with someone who's thinking on a certain line, if you're going to be presenting it to someone else afterwards or with the eye towards having it have an audience? Yeah, I think really, well, for one, just engaging in someone's writing is just really cool for me. Cause it's a step outside of, like myself and trying to interact with them and I'm just diving into their work. So then I actually have good questions because they spent time researching this and writing about it. So when I engage with their work, I usually get a deeper conversation. And then when you just talk to someone in a conversation, like the whole power of just oral conversation, usually just get a lot more ideas broken down and a lot of information put out quickly. Uh, like one thing of why I like to do these mixtape shows because music does the same thing. It has this ability to convey a lot of information. So does conversation. So yeah, it really just, it works on kind of both of those levels really, really nicely. And it's stuff I like to do anyway, like doing journalism and writing. I interview a lot of people. So I like to just put it out into the world. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I, I learned a lot from it. Sweet. Thank you. I, I learned from final strong, listen to it too, every, every episode. So thank you. I could yammer on about the final straw. <laughs> this first track is Behind Enemy Lines by Dead Prez. I chose this song, Behind Enemy Lines by Dead Prez, because they were one of the most eye opening artists for me when I first heard them. Their album, Let's Get Free, it blew my mind and it just opened me up to learn about so much more history, uh, things I wasn't learning in high school. I, I believe I heard this album when I was in high school. And they were talking about Fred Hampton Jr. And, and like Fred Hampton and the Panthers. And it got me to look and dig into so many more people. They talked about Nat Turner. And this was stuff I wasn't learning in high school, of course. So I would go into the library and try to look up these people. And that's what really just opened my whole world into actually learning history and, and things like that. And I was starting up as a hip hop artist. I started when I was 13 and I was working with... I did these hoops and hip hop tournaments that I started when I was 13 in my neighborhood in North Denver. And I was a big fan of, of Mood, whose main flow when Dante from, from Ohio. And I had called this 1-800 number on the back of their CD and I got a hold of them. And they, were, they sent us banners for the tournament. And when they came out to Denver, they were actually doing a show with, it was uh, with the filmmaker, uh, Tanya 
Cuevas Martinez, and she had she was premiering this film called Voice of the Voiceless about Mumia Abu Jamal. So I was like 14, and they brought me into this show, and I got to meet this film director. I got to see the film on Mumia. Dead Prez was there. Uh, Medusa, Last Emperor, J. Ru the Damager. And I was just this young, this rapper, and they just blew my mind. And they just took me in and just taught me so much, told me what books to get. So Dead Prez was just such an important band for me, uh, artist, and just really one of the best hip hop groups that I've ever heard. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I I had no idea that that you had that experience with the with the show, and I'm sure they appreciated the like the spunk of like a young person who would call in and, and be organizing this sort of stuff. So that's, yeah, that's awesome to have that experience for me. It was like, I came across this album and the song in the early two thousands, like doing anti-war work and people just sharing stuff like the coup and dead Prez and immortal technique and these other like political hip hop artists. And they were, they were definitely blowing my mind in the same kind of way that you were describing. I didn't like I had, I had read about and heard about, Fred Hampton, but didn't realize about his son and making the connection between like the politicized prisoners movement or like political prisoners movement in the US. It wasn't a way that I had like looked at prisons at that point. I kind of been involved in um, through, I went to a Catholic high school and was Catholic for a little bit and kind of approached politics from the, from that sort of perspective. So the way that I engaged around prison stuff initially was around the death penalty. There was a lot of activism in the late nineties and I guess before around abolishing the death penalty. And so like we go to, since I live near San Quentin, we go to um, with people from my youth group and people from my high school um, go down to San Quentin and hold vigils or go to like conferences in Berkeley about the death penalty or about specific cases like Mumia's. And I guess I never really had thought about, this is one of the pieces that like, helped me to start thinking about like the different stories in prison than what I was seeing from either like gangster rap stuff, like death row records content or, uh, or stuff that was presented in movies at the time or was, you know, talking about the struggle of surviving. And it wasn't just about the individualized struggle of the person in a place and thus the kind of like story of redemption that that kind of story will lead one to think through. You know, this is one of the things that like presented a narrative where it's these individuals struggling, struggling in their own lives, but also alongside of each other and against a common enemy that I found really inspiring and found it really inspiring at the time. Yeah, I love that. Thanks for sharing that. Along like with what you were talking about of the looking at different types of rap, this really taught me a lot about uh, the importance of communities and building with people by listening to Dead Press because I had been listening to. Uh, sound bombing and lyricist lounge and i saw how all these different gr- crews worked together and artists helped each other with solidarity and like kanye was producing for dead press at this time too he was working with them and head rush and these different uh to hear and these other producers and really just seeing how people work together was important because you're usually getting this um individualist nature from education or from a lot of like you know talent show mentality or like rock and roll, like the head person. So learning more about that was important. And it really, it was important to see how, uh, like in the first verse by M1, he says, and she be dreaming about his day to release. She hate the police, but loved by her grandma who hugs and kisses her. And that's just a really strong line that I've grown to learn more about now. But when I had heard them say like, they hate the police, it was really empowering as a kid in high school, because I had seen the police officer at my school choke slam a kid Mm. and put him to where he needed to be brought out on a stretcher. They hurt his back. And I had been pulled over and accused of selling drugs in my own driveway. And the police pulled me out by my hair and ripped out my hair and told my mom to go inside the house where they destroyed my car in high school too. So I had these feelings where I was just receiving this, you know, what Cornell West calls the Santa classification of, of history of like Martin Luther King, the only one narrative, you know, and had learned how the U.S. quote did bad things in the past by um, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and surveillance, but had never heard the story of Mark Clark and Fred Hampton being assassinated. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and by yeah by by embracing and disnifying or like incorporating the stories of you know, like Malcolm X and Martin to to some very degree, like some little sliver of the surface of those two stories, like the U.S. history system has, it sort of 
closes out opportunities to hear all those other voices of people that were in struggle that maybe would not, not to say that like Martin or Malcolm would not like if you like a deep study of those two individuals and what they contributed is it offers so much that is, you know, challenging to a lot of radicals today, let alone the, the status quo. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah. I was really just saying it's like really just deep in the narrative and told more of the full story. That's so often uh, ignored. So this uh, next song we're playing is Attica Blues by Archie Shep from the album Attica Blues. First, why why did you choose this song? What what importance does it have for you? Well, I um I, I grew up in a house where there was like a, a huge age range between myself and my parents. Like they're both in their 80s now. Um, I'm in my 40s. And so like the acceptable types of music that were available to me growing up were stuff that was more from the 40s, 50s, and then like somewhat of the 60s kind of started seeping in. So and living in the suburbs of the Bay Area, there was in the 80s and 90s, especially in the 90s, like a huge amount of quote unquote oldie stations that were playing. They were playing like doo-wop stuff sometimes, but most of it was rock and roll and R&B and soul and sometimes some funk. And so growing up, not being able to buy albums in my household, I would listen to a lot of the radio and really fell in love with music from this wide era, as varied as it is. So yeah, that's that's kind of like one reason that I like the song so much, but it kind of touches its, you know, this this approach towards the historical events of the early 1970s and the Attica uprising of 1971, following, among other things, the murder of George Jackson um, on the other coast. But when Attica prison rose up, I'm sure like listeners are familiar and took some folks hostage. Some of the guards treated them decent, like outside parties were sent in to negotiate and to view and verify that that the, the hostages were being held in good condition. But there's recordings of Governor Rockefeller and President Nixon talking about how Rockefeller was sending in National Guard to, to kill basically whoever. And the National Guard ended up killing tons of prisoners and tons of the hostages. And afterwards murdering a few of the prisoners as an after the fact retaliation against organizers. And so for me, like there's the beauty of the, of like the music with the, like the blaring horns and the smacking bass, the singing strings and the vocalists sort of choralizing and it's really beautiful and simple and sweet words of, of hope and fear and intention. And it kind of feels like with that short, like repeatable, series of lyrics that they they share the chorus is kind of like a prayer like a mantra um it reminds me of some of the some of the most moving and i don't know hypnotizing parts of um fella Kuti, like the one of the main leaders of Afrobeats stuff and just kind of lets you sort of lets the words like and the intentions kind of vibrate through you um and then politically it's important for me because um seeing this seeing this trajectory of abolitionist struggle and anti-prison struggle as not just the thing that people who are inside are facing, although that is super real and the communities on the outside, but that I gain a lot of heart from the idea that people have been, this is a part of a wider struggle. It's not just to get about police or about prisons, but against police also, like you shared in the last one. And, and that it definitely drives from like African American and indigenous um, struggles to be free of things like chattel slavery and and settler colonial white supremacy, but that that's also as a white person myself a struggle that I can recognize that also white people have participated in. We have we have like a very like a very good reason, many very good reasons, millions of very good reasons to be involved in this sort of struggle, and so like through that sort of thought pattern i i don't know it it moves me it makes me feel really good it, it gets me hyped yeah thanks for sharing burst and thanks for breaking down yeah the meaning and and more about attica and those two uh singers on the track is joe armstead and albertine robertson and their vocal work is just amazing i think the drummer wrote the lyrics for that song for archie oh that's awesome and the that whole album is really good. William Kunstler is on there, the the famed lawyer who defended a lot of the Panthers. And then uh, I really love the song Steam. And that's a song that I think Archie had written about his friend who had died an untimely death. And the track is really powerful too. 
So this next song is by Vic Mensa. It's the song called Shelter, and it features Wycliffe Sean and Chance the Rapper. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for playing the track. And uh, really, this this track is just so powerful. And I first approached it in the spirit of of June Jordan, who said, you know, whenever we do mixtapes or canons or syllabus, we should always include people, contemporary artists who are releasing art right now and and showcase them. So I was looking for a new an artist who's just released something, Vic Mensa, who's amazing. And the song has Wycliffe Sean and the I was a big fan of of the Fuji's, of course. I loved Wycliffe's solo work. Uh, the Carnival was a big album for me. So when uh, uh, Vic mentions that, Wycliffe told me call nine one one. You know, back to his his older music. And this track was just really powerful to me. I mean, he's talking about hospital workers and scrubs with no PPE, but they got money for riot gear. I mean, this was just seen so blatantly in the uh, George Floyd uprisings. And then when he's talking about uh, Chance the Rapper, his his verse on the manifest destiny, a bunch of land they could steal. Think about Kenneth Walker and Philando Castile. Such powerful bars there. And I was reading more about this song, and Vic Mensa said that he had received a, a DM from someone telling them about uh, Julius Jones, who he references in the song. And that's uh, someone who is on life in Oklahoma. And he said he started a relationship with Julius Jones. So I thought that was a really another powerful part of this song to to highlight. And he also talks about um, the killing of Elijah McLean was in Aurora, Colorado. And we were at these protests as well. Just so sad. And it's he, you know, he highlights Elijah's name, which is so important. And also when he's talking about his his friend, Julius Jones, who's on death row and in prison and a reason why this this episode is important to me and why I like the final straw and other podcasts like Beyond Prisons is one of a good friends who we started our record label with, Dirty Laboratory, uh, Robert. He's in prison for life for drug related charges. And we try to write to him and talk as much as we can. And uh, just so tragic. So that's why the song is powerful for me. You keep that relationship alive. I'm sure that Robert appreciates it too. Yeah, I was like, I was looking up Julius Jones a little bit too while listening to it. And it's CNN seems to think that at least he was commuted in November off of death row, which is like pretty recent, pretty contemporary. And it kind of, I think, puts this Vic Mensa like, and like this song at least like referencing Julius a few times and talking about a relationship with him, like in context of this song is like, putting Vic in this, not Pantheon, but like, you know, listing among like all these other victims of state violence and someone who is, while it's important that we have like, that we remember the tragedies that have happened and, and support the families and communities that have lost folks that this song seems kind of like an intervention in Julius's case, even if it wasn't the title of the song. And I'm sure like didn't hurt his, um, his movement to try to like get him to get, you know, get commuted off of death row. At least that's a it's a victory. It's not a like perfect thing, but I really respect that. Yeah, one thing is like the power of music and art too, and just transmitting that information and showing solidarity and inspiring. Yeah, the, there was the one line in here that like really got to me. That like the notes that I took that uh, the like they send us the black plague and then send us a white savior. <laughs> like that line is so good. Yeah. <laughs> So good. That dialectic thing right there between those. <laughs> uh. Yeah, that line is so good. Yeah, this whole this whole song is so many good lines. All right. So now we're going to the song Digging for Windows by Zach De La Roca. Thanks, Purse. Yeah, of course. So let's go in. Why'd you pick this track? Well, I've been a, um, a huge fan of Zach Taylor Rocha's work since uh, since Rage. Like, I didn't listen to any of his stuff before that. But yeah, so, I mean, I first heard Rage from their second album when I was in high school. And that was what took me from, like, a social justice perspective to a to like a radical anti-capitalist perspective. And I always loved like the, the stacks of books that were pictured in reading lists and stuff in their materials. But so in terms of this specific track though, it's the only, so this track was one that was put onto a national prison or nationwide prison strike mix that some comrades in like an abolitionist group 
in, I think in Milwaukee, we're organizing and I hadn't heard it before. And it's hard for me to find Zach's newer stuff because he's oftentimes doing it solo or attached to other crews. And I've just not found a way to like keep up on it, but it always gets to me. And just the idea of like digging for windows, it doesn't have to be, if you're, if you're talking about the lights always being on, but you're also like coming up from underground to try to get to ground surface. Like it just kind of is reminiscent to me of experiences that I've heard about the all night lights in solitary confinement when you're being punished and they're not letting you sleep. Maybe there's loud noises going on too. And also just the feeling of isolation that you're like in a dungeon and you're somehow trapped in this, like this coffin space. And he brings it like in and out of the prison. He talks about the COs and he talks about blowing smoke through the guard, like through the, the bars and, yeah, just a sort of feel feeling of like isolation, fear, conflict, and tying it again back to capitalism and profit and fighting back and striking back against that stuff. I like the fact that artistically it reminds me of some of the really punctuated stuff that he was doing with um, the former dr- drummer of At the Drive In, whose name I don't recall, uh, but with. Um, oh, One Day as a Lion, that is, project? Yeah. It was like a four track or five track demo. That was, it was amazing. If I was younger, I would say it slapped (laughs) so good. And it alienated so many customers at places that I worked when I would play it on the sound system. But yeah. And then I just like listening back through it. I just kind of caught like Zach's lyrical style is so amazing. He's such a good poet and his, the second stanza where he says like see if i pay edison no medicine these yeah. blues ain't mo better when my fever rise in the jungle as quick as the price spikes like there's like three references to, to spike lee right there i'm yeah. pretty sure um, yeah so i i don't know just like his stuff is so rich and so dense with those sort of references that listening to his stuff over and over again i just get more every time yeah thanks and that's with uh, john theodore from Mars Volta at the drive-in that he did one day as a lion with. And I think LP produced this track. Oh, that's awesome. And then they came together again on Run the Jewels mm-hmm. like a couple years ago. But yeah, the Zach's verses are so good in here. The last verse is just amazing where he's saying, under the lights of their choppers, bodies, tools for their coffers, not worth the cost of our coffins, stare at a future so toxic, and then won't mark the name on a ballot so they can be free to devour our options. That's just amazing. He did rhyme capital with capital and capital. Oh yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's awesome. No, no uh, so <laughs> <laughs> they have different meaning in each one. I, I was like, yeah. really? Oh, okay. Yeah. That's a different. Yeah. <laughs> to quote Jay-Z double entendre. Don't ask me how <laughs> <laughs> sweet. Yeah. The track's so good. And a, a big rage fan as well. So love it. They, they totally shaped myself growing up. Like I didn't, I'm glad that I read a lot of the stuff that they pr- like promoted. Like I wouldn't have done papers on Fanon in college if not for hearing that stuff in, in high school. And like, I got to see them a few times growing up. And I remember one concert where I think it was at the, the Cow Palace up on the second level, probably like 1999, maybe. And there, like Zach stops the show at one point because he heard that um, he heard rumors that women were getting let towards the front, towards the stage, if they would expose their breasts to dudes that were in the way. And he at least he like addressed it at this point and was like, "I'm going to come down there and fucking personally kick your ass if you don't stop that bullshit. This is not the space for that." And the Damn. fact, like, I had never seen a performer on stage. A, I hadn't gone to very many shows at that point, but B, I'd never heard a performer like call out misogyny and take a stand on it before like that. And I thought it was amazing. That's awesome. What do we have coming up next? We have Rick Wilson and the song is called Fight Like Ida B and Marsha P. It's kind of kind of kismet how it came together because the first verse says fight the power like Chuck Rage Against the Machines. So uh I really just love this track by by Rick Wilson. It's so powerful. One reason that I I really love it is just it it just really honors the the legacy of the genealogy of these movements of of going against white supremacy, going against uh, prisons. Uh, the there's a line in the second verse is so good. I got bodily autonomy and its policy is people over property. And then saying abolish the prisons or don't speak a word to me. 
stop ice and let them off free, let the kids be in intersex surgeries, and just all the different forms of domination that this track goes against by talking about um, Black disabled lives, Black queer lives. It's just so important and just so good to hear in art. You know, going on that genealogy, it really, you know, rest in peace to to Bill Hooks, recently passed away, and all her work on anti-domination and all the work that Critical Resistance has done for prison abolition and getting that word out. And I really just think that this track honors all of these people who've, who've done so much work and are still doing incredible amounts of important work. Yeah, absolutely. That's very well put. Um, and yeah, that like make like tying all those, the, the intersections of all those different forms of, of control together really like allows for liberation for all of us when we fight together in those ways. I was trying to think of like, that track came out at the same time as as this track Lockdown by Anderson Pack that I was also like super stoked on, um, which I forgot to put into this mixtape, which I might have before, but yeah. But the Rick Wilson track was just again so rich with reference and so so fun to move to and yeah, really inspirational. Yeah, so dancey too. It's just a great track. Cool. So let's go ahead and play The Door by Invincible. Yeah. I was just saying, uh, thanks for sharing this track. It blew my mind when I heard it. So yeah, please, please talk more about this song. Yeah. So I heard that track from this, I think in like 2004, 2003, probably. I don't know. I don't really remember that much about this group anymore. Actually. Okay. I'm thinking I probably picked this up at the, the critical resistance and insight women against violence conference that I think happened um, in 2005 or 2006 at Merritt College, if I'm remembering correctly, in Oakland. Um, I went with uh, members of our our cop watch group and there was a there was so much, so much information. I got challenged left and right. Uh, I'm still thinking about some of the conversations that I heard and that I participated in there. But but so this was a compilation that was from a compilation put together by a group called Justice Now, the album. Yeah, I can't find anything about it online, but it's called the We That Sets Us Free, Building a World Without Prisons. And it's um, a, about the struggle against women's prisons created by this group in the early 2000s. As you could hear, uh, Invincible, the hip hop artist made a reference to No More Prisons in the 04. Mm. Um, and the CD also contains, if you can ever find a copy, it's um, speeches, like it ends with this, with some audio from Angela Davis, but the CD has spoken word by a bunch of artists. It's got some artists who are behind bars in, in women's correctional facilities, or so-called women's correctional facilities. Voices of Ruth Gilsman, uh, Wilson Gilmore, Asada Shakur, and Yuri Kochiyama, and other musicians too. Invincible is a hip hop artist from Detroit and produced this one album. The one album that I've at least heard is Shapeshifters. It came out in 2008. And yeah, there, some of the songs on there are just phenomenal. Uh, the last track in particular is about gentrification and features finale. Um, oh, nice. And also uh, Grace Lee Boggs. Like, there's a video that accompanies it that's on YouTube that's like a 10-minute video that's just about gentrification and, and community struggles against it in, in Detroit. But yeah, I, so I, I mean, I picked that song because I haven't like I had to send you a, a track of it. I couldn't find it anywhere online and it, it'd be a, a shame if it was buried. It's just such a good, good song. And it also like the rest of the CD focuses on the people that are stuck in women's prisons and how that's not like a part of a lot of the narrative of incarceration. But since I don't know where it's at now because it's been a sharp dive in decarceration nationwide, but like starting around the, the early 2010s, as I understand, like the largest population, the largest single like gendered and racialized population going into U.S. prisons was black women, but, um, or people going into women's prisons and women's prisons were the, the largest growing portion of, of the prison system that might've changed with, um, all the ice raids. I'm not sure, but it's just not like, there's a lot of violence that people in women's prisons face, that makes it so that it's harder to see the levels of resistance that they participate in um, from the outside. It's not n like not to say that it, it's not brave to participate in a, a prison riot or an uprising or uh, an escape, but um, those things are reported much more from facilities that are deemed to be men's facilities. And this, like, if you if anyone wants to read more on this topic, it's a it's 
it's probably a decade old at this point, but um, Vicki Law did a really good book um, called uh, or about women's struggles behind bars. Um, yeah, mm. that's what I got. Nice. Thanks, Burse. Uh, another good book is Arrested Justice 2 mm-hmm. by uh, Beth Ritchie. Came out around 2012 on that topic. This uh, this song was just really powerful. It's the first time I had heard it when you sent it to me. So thank you. And the verse two, when she's talking about uh, a woman who was defending herself and put into prison, it, it really reminded me of Brescia Meadows' story. And she was freed after, I believe it was 10 months in jail for killing her abuser. And yeah, it's just such a powerful song and so many good messages in this. And it ends with Angela Davis as well. Yeah, just thanks for sharing this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, that kind of like reminds me also, there was a group that was around when I was um, organizing in Northern California, I had some friends that were working with it called Purple Berets. And I don't know the overall of, of the specific like feminist organization, besides the fact that they were supporting um, people who had like gone into women's prisons for defending themselves um, mm-hmm. and like the disproportionate charges that they would get. Um, not dissimilar to the racialized disproportionate charging that happens in wider society too for self-defense or acts of violence or what have you. So just to throw that out there in case anyone wants to look that up. What uh, what are we going to hear next, Chris? We're going to listen to Out of Sight by a Pawnee B. Fly featuring Lifelong. Yeah, so I, I chose this track just for one a Pawnee B Fly is just such a good MC and just such a good rapper. And this song is just really good. Lifelong is an amazing MC too. All his work with Anti Pop, Consortium, and just a just a good legacy of both these rappers. And this song was just really important just for the larger context. There were so many good records coming out at this time. So one compilation that was really influential to me was Hip Hop for Respect. And that was put together by uh, Mostef and Kwali, and they took 41 rappers for the amount of bullets that killed Amadou Diallo. The police murdered him, and they had 41 rappers on the project. And this track was that whole album was all anti, anti police, anti prisons. And then this track is in the same legacy of from Raptivism Records, who hmm. did No More Prisons, and they did this whole compilation. They did two of these records it was just a compilation of rappers and they used all the money to um to fight prison sentences and and other you know prison industrial complex or pic and in the same area you also had the unbound project which was a whole bunch of um artists who came together to free mumia and they were working at you know rage was working on this project as well and uh, just this whole legacy, and this is how this song fits into that of being part of all that and the important people. Um, great, great artists as well, like Mike Ladd is on the Unbound Project and just so many good artists to shout out. But uh, the reason I, I really like this song is because I see rappers as world builders. And um, shout out to my friend Buddha, who's a rapper who made me think deeper about this. And when we're talking about concepts of abolition, or even concepts of of anarchism, or looking at, like the Zapatistas say, of prefiguring the world. The imagination is so needed, as Miriam Kaba always talks about with abolition and Ruth Wilson Gilmore, and how important imagination is. And that's why I think music is so critical to this, and and rappers and the worlds they build is just so helpful in the whole endeavor of thinking about these things. Yeah, absolutely. Do you feel like, I mean, it kind of like strikes me, and maybe it was the time in my life when I was paying more attention to, to contemporary music and contemporary artists much more. Like I've got my eye on like you and soul and some Lee and uh, like Lee Reed just put out a track in support of um, like anti homeless sweeps in Hamilton. Like I see certain specific artists that I really appreciate and can pay attention to, but it felt like at that time, maybe, maybe just the Comcast, like, enclosure of radio waves hadn't fully happened like i know camiel in the bay area still was an independent hip-hop station davy d was doing like djing there and bringing on tons of activists with a political bent and talking about issues of gentrification and police violence and, and things like this but so the like the infrastructure was different 
but does it feel to you like things have changed in terms of in terms of um, political engagement and visibility around issues, or is it just the algorithms have changed so that we're not seeing all the like independent artists that are doing that? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I really think it's more about the infrastructure and the availability to find it. I definitely don't think it's less artists not doing the work. I, there's more artists than ever doing amazing things. But I think like you mentioned, the algorithm and the infrastructure kind of creates a fracturing or a shattering to find these artists. But, you know, people like, uh, you know, podcasts, uh, sub media, they've done little shorts of good artists doing amazing things like the one that uh, sub media put out that highlighted Lee Reed and Ruby Ibarra and so many other hip hop artists. But I also think it is something that has to do with the infrastructure is more shattered too. And there's a lot more artists. So you don't have a lot of compilations going out into stores, you know, like you could have found, I found hip hop for respect. Like at a Sam Goody, I think, you know, like a big store, like that would be seen no more prisons at Best Buy, which I think it even had distribution there. So that is a big difference I see. But that's just because things are so different now, too, with technology. Most people are just streaming stuff. So it's like thrown into a playlist now. I think yeah. maybe it's more about directing people. But uh, yeah, what do you think? No, I think I think that's right on. Like, it doesn't strike like, people see how fucked up stuff is. And I like people use that world building possibility and that like imagination to create also like most people, most artists that I see don't create just straight across the board. Just, this is my political album. It's mostly like here. I'm like, I'm throwing some politics into the song or like a couple of these tracks are standalone. Like I'm talking about this issue because it's super important, but yeah, I think that, I think that what you say about the, I'm a huge fan, like I said, of, of MP3s and of this format and how kind of ethereal it feels. I know it's not an ecological answer to distributing music, but it's easy to share stuff. But one thing that I feel like <clears throat> I lose out of it is the, um, the album structure that I'm sure artists put a lot of work into. Like if you listen, I used to listen to a lot of jazz and just even if each of the pieces could stand alone, there was sort of a story that was told by them in a certain combination. And while I appreciate mixtapes like this, because it allows us to be the artists creating new, like we're, we create still this like frozen version of, of what would be like a, a playlist online. We curate these things and we give, you know, like respect to the artists that are producing them and invite people to go and check out more. And I'm thinking more about like less about this interaction, but more about like, I like making mixtapes for people, but like, I think that there's something about yeah the technology and and streaming platforms that definitely probably makes it a lot less visible. I would invite anyone who doesn't know about the case of Amadou Diallo, um, just because you're younger or whatever, to look it up. It's a tragic case that was an amazing groundswell for anti-police violence organizing around the so-called U.S. and internationally and in the New York area. That was super inspiring to folks on the other coast, like me. Yeah, and thank if you. Folks yeah, and if folks want to find that that rage like work on Mumia, I think it's there's an album called Mumia Nine One One that's like a single with a few different mixes of like a track that's like a super super band version, right? And that kind of reminds me of like the CIA song too. That like on oh, KRS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Last Stamp. Last Stamp. Criminal, criminal institution or something like that. Criminals in Action. The CIA. Yeah. 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 And, and just to back to the algorithm thing, like people, most people I talk to, even young people in high school, they, they're tired of the algorithms too. And they're hungry for, for mixtapes or when artists put listening or reading guides in their yeah. music notes, people love that. And I just found that out by accident. I had done a, just a short talk on hip hop at this, this uh, school. And some people, this, this student was asking me about some good rappers. So I just kind of, I just like blacked out and wrote a whole like a hundred songs and I sent it to that student and that went all over the school and people were sharing that list. And it was funny that it had high school students writing me about Razkaz and stuff. And like, they were all about it. They, they were all into guru and gang star and like people are just hungry for it because they're tired of the canned algorithms. Yeah. Maybe we need to just, yeah, that, that sounds like the, the solution right there is like mixtapes and this is it. We're doing it. <laughs> Walk it. <laughs> yep, that was my that was my sly, elaborate scheme of promoting this episode. <laughs> okay, so this next song is the song George Jackson by J.P. Robinson, a cover of Bob Dylan. 
just talk a bit about why you uh, chose this track and what it means. I used to listen. I used to listen to a lot of hip hop. I used to listen to a lot of punk. I used to listen to a lot of metal and, um, I still have like a deep appreciation and my aesthetic roots sit in, in those genres. But, um, a couple of years ago when I was bartending, I found that going back to that R and B and soul roots of listening that I was in two years ago, but just taking a deeper dive with what was available on the internet really allowed me to, um, explore music that I wouldn't have heard on those big stations in the Bay area. I found a series of, um, of comp discs from a record label called Kent records. And this was on there. There was one in particular called change is going to come. That was um, music from the civil rights and black liberation movement or era. And, uh, found this, yeah, found this track by JP Roberts. I know of one other one album that JP Roberts has done, but he was a musician, I think who recorded this at least in Miami in the um, mid seventies. And doesn't seem to have much of much of a like recorded career beyond that but i hadn't heard this song before i didn't know that it was actually a bob dylan song and i gotta say that like some of some of the most amazing bob dylan songs i would say my favorite bob dylan songs are the songs that are not sung by bob dylan because he was an amazing or is an amazing like writer um and inspires some amazing people but like who's going to remember bob dylan's version of all along the watchtower for instance right mm. This is, but so J.P. Roberts' soulful rendition of the song about George Jackson just really gets me every time I hear it. And when I first heard it, I thought maybe that J.P. Roberts had been like corresponding with George Jackson. Mm -hmm. But it also feels important, kind of like the Attica Blues song, to point to this like point in specific history, much like like Nat Turner as a symbol, um, for instance, as was referred to earlier, or uh, yeah, tons of other characters in the trajectory of freedom on this continent and around the world. Like George Jackson was, uh, had joined the Panther, par the Black Panther Party while he was in prison. He was in prison for, um, I think, like some, like some pesky, like tiny robbery of, and he got some charge of like a year to life in the California system, which was not an uncommon thing for black men at the time and in the California system. And he, uh, he took to politicizing himself inside. He, his prison letters got published Soledad brother. Yeah. Uh, and then he was able to write like a full book, um, blood in my eye. This ties back again to like the modern abolitionist movement too, because, um, Angela Davis, was a supporter of his around this time. And Jackson was murdered on the yard in San Quentin. I want to say August 21st. But yes, you're right. August 21st, 1971. Yeah. And um, ostensibly because he was trying to escape and had a gun, but um, the guards are vicious liars and racists. And so kind of who knows, but he definitely was inspiring the creation of like, not only organizing, but, but guerrilla action against the white supremacist state in a way that really frightened the prison and inspired many on the outside. His brother, Jonathan, was killed earlier while attempting to liberate four prisoners from, the, or three prisoners, excuse me, from the, from the Marine County Courthouse. Angela had been a supporter of the Jackson family and had been visiting with George and writing letters with him. And Angela faced a huge prison sentence for or partially for being a communist, but, on, but also for Jonathan had attempted to like break out the prisoners with point being, I, th I thought that the track was, I think the track was important to tie back to that specific instance in history and the continued influence. Like I keep talking to prisoners on the inside who are reading George Jackson and it's still being banned by prisons because they have reason to be frightened by it. Uh, thanks for sharing. And, Blood in My Eye is so powerful and the way that he talks about fascism, yeah. being an anti-fascist. And, and one little stanza I really love from this song is he says, prison guards, they cursed him as they watched him from above, but they were frightened of his power. They were scared of his love. So well put. Yeah, super moving. So what's Thanks. up next? Now we're going to the song Headhunter by Rocky Rivera featuring Bamboo. So I, I, I really enjoyed the song. Um, I'm wondering, like, do you have a relationship with Rocky Rivera? Like, how did you find it and, and sort of what does it speak to you? Yeah, I, I just really like this song 
because I don't know any of the people from their crew personally, but I've always been a fan of Rocky Rivera, the message she puts in her music, then of Bamboo as well. And I really like uh, all the people from their kind of like their extended crew, like Classy and Ruby Ibarra and just all these all these MCs are really inspirational. And Rocky Rivera and Bamboo are uh, there are a couple as well. So I like following their their story. And I think their kid is a is a rapper too. But this song is just it's just really powerful and it's it's more it's more militant in the way that it, it speaks about, which is it's good to hear in a song. And another thing I really enjoyed was Bamboo's verse and where he says, a retired freedom fighter, such a liar. I ain't leaving till every juvenile prison on fire. Yeah. And I just love how he started that verse. And, you know, as someone who is uh, against prisons and then especially juvenile prisons and the violence that happens in those. And it's just really powerful. That's why really this song spoke to me. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I hadn't heard Rocky Rivera before, I don't think, but I, I'm well like I'm pretty well familiar with Bamboo's work and am a huge fan and have such respect for him as an MC and also like all the beats that he decides to choose to put underneath are so good. Yeah, that's that's about what I got to say, but I'm excited to to hear more from Rocky Rivera afterwards. Yeah, her music is yeah, her music's great. Let's go to Lucasville by Blackbird Rom from Under the Starling Host. I really like this song. This um, anarchist punk band from Santa Cruz was one of my favorites when they came around the, the anarchist book fair scene around the early 2000s, like especially the one in Santa Cruz, they would play at it. And this song really inspired me. I mean, their music, the, this album and like the two albums, the one on either side of it, I think are, they really spoke to a certain time in my life um, and made me feel like a sense of rage and desire and passion that not not a lot of music touches me but this song in, was inspired by the um, the Lucasville uprising and the Staunton Lind book that PM Pass, Press published on it and talks a little bit about it but like what's inspiring to me about the subject matter is that um, not only was it bringing up a contemporary case of a prison uprising that's in the that many would identify as being in the the trajectory of the Attica uprising as a cross racial rebellion against inhumane treatment, but also that um, in the early 90s, it was it was foreshadowed because at the same time, the Waco attacks were happening. So the media was totally focused on that. But you had these prisoners hanging banners made out of bed sheets out the windows with the words convict race written on them. And you had a sort of like peace being kept inside with, I'm not a fan of street organizations in and of themselves or prison organizations, but there was a, a piece that was being held internally between between a white supremacist organization and what was called at the time black gangster disciples and as well as like the Sunni Muslims who had initiated the uprising in protest of uh, medical policies. Like the fact that they it was an opportunity. It was taken as an opportunity to stop bickering and fighting between different sets and different communities and to stop yeah, to stop the violence in a way to like unify against the common enemy, I think falls under the same like inspiration as gang truces in Los Angeles during the Rodney King uprising and those sort of things for me. So that's, that's why I decided to include it. Nice. Thanks for making those connections and for the background. And this was in 1993 in Southern Ohio. Mm -hmm. I think it was in 90. Yeah, I guess you're right. It wasn't 93. I thought it was 92. Cool. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing this. I had never heard this song either. Um, you're going to close us out now, I, I reckon. What do you got for us? The last track is by Soul and DJ Payne One called FTL. I believe it goes, fuck the law, fuck the law. <laughs> <laughs> Many times. Yes, that is what FTL stands <laughs> for. So um, I chose this track. Because when we're going back to these this legacy of artists who share information, Soul was one of these artists even before I knew Tim or Soul, who's also part of the Channel Zero Network. I'd get his CDs or his zines at shows, and he'd have recommended readings that I learned a lot from. And I just really learned so much from Soul. I think he's the first one who told me about the poet Bob Kaufman, first one who told me to read Emma Goldman. So just the legacy that Soul builds on is so good. He has a new album coming out next month as well with Pain One. 
And I really like this song because he digs into colonialism and white supremacy, uh, talking about Columbus and the genocide of the indigenous. And then the song ends on an anti-prison sentiment with abolish the prisons or set fire to the prisons as this call for um, a call for abolition, which is so powerful in this song. Yeah, that's really awesome. I like, I'm really inspired constantly by like, I've, so I was telling you earlier that I'd first learned about soul from um, one of my coworkers had been paying attention to Anacon and burned for me a bunch of the discs. And so that's when I started listening to that record label way back in like 98 or 99. And yeah, it's, to see like, not only did I, I really enjoyed the work that he was producing then, but once I realized that he was starting to identify as an anarchist and that he was getting engaged in politics to the degree it was like, I was super, super impressed. And he's had a, he's had and continues to have a huge impact on a lot of people. When I've gone to our radio shows, a part of the anarchist and anti-authoritarian radio network that has its conferences every few years in Europe and we have a a live show where we spend like uh, eight hours in a radio station, everybody taking turns interviewing each other and sharing segments and stuff. Um, It's really fun, but soul is always like one of the really featured artists. There are people internationally can approach his content. They find it entertaining. They find it moving and they find, they find it intelligible and inspiring. And I, I think that, um, yeah, I hope that soul hears this and, and gets reminded of that. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. That's so cool. And this next song is Jailbreak by Thin Lizzy. I, it's just, a, okay. So Thin Lizzy, um, yeah. Thin Lizzy was an amazing rock band from Ireland. And I don't know, they have some really goofy, I blame Disney for promoting the boys are back in town, but um, this same song off of that album yeah it's just a fun song about um breaking out of jail because who doesn't like that except for the guards and uh bootlickers (laughs) thank you for tuning into this episode of the time talks podcast part of the channel zero network i want to thank my friend burst for doing this episode with me and sharing knowledge experiences stories and good music There's a link to the Final Straw Radio podcast in the show notes. Please support their Patreon. Thank you to Awareness for the music. We have the playlist link in the show notes. Email me some song suggestions to add to the online playlist at timeraps at riseup.net. This is The Final Straw. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop.com.